I think I'm live. Good morning. Uh, this is Tracy O'Connell, and I'm coming at you at early, well, it's 9 a.m. where I live in North Carolina, and I am feeling inspired this morning and wanted to come on and chat with you about some things that have been on my mind and kind of give you a sense of what it is that I do with people uh, in my work and in my coaching as a mindset coach. And we've all been hearing about this book, Untamed, right? And it is an amazing book by Glennon Doyle. And if you haven't heard of Glennon or read any of her other books, I highly recommend it. Um, her first book, Carry On Warrior, was about stories of motherhood and trials and tribulations of becoming an adult. It was amazing. And her second book was called Love Warrior, which was about her relationship with her and her marriage and the trials and tribulations of that relationship. And so moving, so raw, so real. And her most recent book, Untamed, is again, more about becoming herself, becoming her true, raw, authentic self. And people ask me, oh, is it about becoming a lesbian? No, it is not about becoming a lesbian. It's about becoming your true self what in whatever manifestation that is. And it's about letting go of perception and the need to please and the need to please others, to please our parents, to please society, to do the right thing, the moral thing, the ethical thing by the standards that have been set for us and programmed for us throughout society and our conditioning and calling that into question, calling that into its own validity. And what's really cool is that I've been wanting to read this book since it came out 28 years ago, Women Who Run With the Wolves, and I'm only now just reading it. <clears throat> and wow, it is full of all of the same things. And I have no doubt that Glennon Doyle was inspired by this book and by all the stories within it, because the stories are as old as time about the wild woman archetype. And I'm speaking to and presuming there are a lot of women in the audience, but there is also a wild male archetype. And it's really this, this being who you really are without the societal conditioning. Maybe you could think of Tarzan as the wild male archetype. And so what I wanted to say today is that, you know, I spend a lot of time working with others to build their positive self-regard. And self-regard is not the same as positive, self-regard is not the same as self-care. Um, even self-care is taboo for a lot of people. They don't want to, they think it's selfish to spend time on themselves. Um, and, you know, we're working on that, right, as a culture and prioritizing that and, you know, but it's not the same as just going and getting your nails done or having a bubble bath or even taking a nap or meditating. Um, Self-regard is something completely different. You can develop self-regard by doing practices of self-care. And of course, I completely value and validate the importance of self-care. Um, but what this is, what I'm really talking about today is how we learn to respect ourselves. When you regard someone, when you have high regard for someone, it means that you hold them in high esteem, you respect them, you admire them, you see them as an authority as someone who has value and worth and you want to hear what they have to say you want to engage with them you want to follow them you want to read their books or watch their movies or listen to them talk listen to their podcast um spend time with them and 
what's interesting is that we do a lot of this. We value the opinion of others that we regard. And then we have to ask ourselves at different points in life, we're confronted with how we regard ourselves. And what's so interesting to me and so sad is how much self-loathing people have um, and how much we judge ourselves and we have that inner critic that's constantly evaluating and shaming us. Um, and we spend so much time managing perception and it's exhausting, right? Um, you know, we want others to see us in a certain way. We have ideal identities and we have unwanted identities. And the ideal identities are things that are usually completely unachievable. Um, things like uh, being Mother Teresa um, or being Jeff Bezos. <laughs> Maybe, maybe not, uh, you know, being someone who's held, well, you get what I'm saying. We spend a lot of time trying to to achieve things of, of being, you know, superwoman, superman, um, and we're never going to get there, right? And so then anytime we fall short of that, we feel bad and we feel like we're not enough. And then there's the opposite of that, which is the... I'm losing my thought here. Um, so unwanted identities, right? Ways that we do not want to be seen. We do not want others to see us in this way. We only want to be seen in this way. So anytime we're not seen in this way, or we are seen in this unwanted way, we feel shame. And here's the thing. I know nobody likes to talk about shame, but I'm going to talk about it because it's one of my favorite things to talk about because I know that it will apply to every single person in the audience. Um, shame is a universal emotion. And it is that feeling that we have when we feel like we don't belong. And I've been thinking about when and how and what I was doing when I first experienced or if the best memories, uh, stories that I had. And I woke up this morning thinking about when was the first time that I experienced that sense of, of shame, of not belonging. And it was when I was in second grade and I was living in Kentucky and we had just moved there from, from Houston, Texas. And I was, it was Lexington, Kentucky. And if you've never been there, um, I mean, this was back in the seventies, but I'm fairly certain it's fairly similar today, which is that it's a very, uh, being preppy was the, the way that people wanted to, um, that was the style. And so even as young as second graders were self-conscious about their clothing and about the brand of their clothing. And, you know, mothers would dress their daughters in the, the finest wear and they would shop at the finest stores. And if you've ever heard of Papagayo, it was a store that sold all, the, it was very expensive. It was kind of like Talbot's, um, but had um, you know, this certain styles like the belts that had little gold um, fasteners and you could exchange the, the, the belt part of different colors. And so you wanted your belt to coordinate with your outfit and you would be wearing, you know, your, your Oxford top and your belt and you might have an applique skirt um, that had some kind of cute little scene on it. And you had to have the necklace with the three beads, the three gold beads, um, to add a bead, they were called. And the add a bead, you got a bead maybe for your birthday or you got a bead for Christmas. And the more beads you had, the more prestigious. And there were those purses that you could change the cover on the button purses. And the, the really nice ones had four buttons, okay? So I remember my mom thinking that this was ridiculous, that I, as a, you know, eight-year-old was trying to compete with these, these girls and the, the amount of money and the, the competition that, that went into being perceived as cool and looking like the other girls. And so she refused to buy these kind of, she refused to spend this kind of money on a, on a child who was still growing, right? And so 
um, we she got me like a button purse that only had three buttons, not four. <clears throat> and people wore top siders, which are like boat shoes, Sperry top siders. And they were really expensive and my foot was still growing. So we went to a store and got me some knockoff version, right? That had like a thicker heel and the laces were different. And she's like, no one's going to notice, right? And then she made me a skirt out of corduroy with a cute little applique and barn scene on it. And it was supposed to be, you know, it was similar to, but it wasn't the brand that everyone else was wearing. And I wore those things to school. And I was ridiculed, right? Like people said, oh, your purse is weird. Why does it only have three buttons instead of four? And your shoes look funny. The, the sole is too thick. And, you know, you don't have an Adabeed necklace. Um, by the way, I'm wearing some of my own jewelry because uh, I'm never going to get a chance to wear this out. And so I'm spending the days in, inside, of course, and um, by myself. And so I'm making it more fun by just jazzing up my sweatpants with a pretty necklace and some lipstick. So anyway, all of this is to say that that I felt shame by that because I was I was ridiculed and I felt like I didn't belong. I wasn't part of the group and, and it was traumatic, right? And shame is that feeling of I feel bad, I am bad. Um I'm not worthy of love and belonging. And go on to say, you know, in fifth grade, we moved to Wisconsin and the style was completely different there. Uh, I remember going to school the first day and I had my hair and ponytails and I had on grow grain ribbons that matched. They were green grow grain ribbons that matched my green wide wheel corduroy pants. And I had a pink button down Oxford and I was wearing a ribbon around my neck that was polka dotted and it was green with white polka dots and i thought this is a great impression to make on the first day of school and the irony was that everyone was wearing baseball shirts and jeans with holes in the knees and playing marbles on the playground getting dirty and I came home from that first day of school and everyone was super nice to me because I'd moved from Kentucky and I had a little Southern accent and they were curious about me. I was new and different. And um, so, so I had good fortune of, of making friends or at least having people interested in me, but I came running in the door that day to my mom and I said, look, um, we've got to go to Shopco, which is the equivalent and back in the seventies to what is now Walmart. Um, and I need some some baseball shirts. I need some jeans. We need to wash them a lot so that they get worn out and the knees have holes in them so that people will, so that I'll fit in, right? And that was a much more comfortable outfit. And my mom was thrilled to, to support me not wearing these gourmet clothes. Um, but I felt shame, like I didn't belong if I had not changed my outfit, right? So we're back and we're little and we're managing perception. And then fast forward on to seventh grade um, when I didn't make the cheerleading um, squad at school and I had done cheerleading as a, as a little one. And I thought that cheerleaders were the way that I was going to be in, in middle school. And I didn't make the team and I was devastated. And I spent all of seventh grade, every time there was a game at school and the cheerleaders were wearing their outfits and I didn't get to be in the limelight. You know, I remember sitting before a, a middle school dance and feeling like um, I was a big loser and no one was gonna notice me and I had a bath that was very a very emo experience of sitting in the bath by myself before the dance started wondering, you know, woe is me, I'll never fit in. And so the point of all of this is that we've been conditioned since we were very, very, very little to fit in. And the price of that is feeling like, or the, the, the reward of that is to feel like we're enough. And we spend all of our adult lives trying to either prove that we're enough or stay small so that people don't think we're too much. And we judge ourselves all the time and harshly doing so. And why? Because the fear of being left out of the group, being ostracized, is that 
is that shame feeling that we're not worthy of love and belonging. And we don't like to talk about shame because it feels like um, a dirty word. But here's the thing, like you're not going to be able to escape it. Shame is universal and it's experienced not in just big things like committing a crime or um, cheating. Um, it's little things. It's little things. It's those tiny little things like I've just shared with you that make you feel like you either are okay or you're not okay. And this is this common theme that I find with all of the folks that I work with is no matter how much they've achieved, no matter how much success or external validation they have, no matter how skinny or how uh, uh, classy or how prestigious their job is or how much money they make or what kind of car they drive or how much they've accomplished, they still feel this emptiness inside. And so what I do with folks is to really help them not avoid shame because you're not going to avoid shame. You're going to encounter it every day, all the time in tiny, small ways. But the way we overcome that is building shame resilience. The difference between people who are confident and comfortable with themselves is not that they're better than you or me. It's not that they're smarter or thinner or prettier or more well-spoken. It's that they have positive self-regard. They have high shame resilience. And it's not about, um, it's, it, you know, you're not just born with it. You, you have it because you have cultivated it. And so that's what I do to keep people from running and hiding and staying small and instead being able to really look at themselves in the mirror or not in the mirror and have positive self-regard, have respect for themselves, enjoy life, uh, admire themselves, feel that sense of comfort, feel a sense of I am enough, I am worthy, I do belong. And when things don't go right, they have the ability to bounce back. And that's what resilience is, um, is the ability to bounce back after hardship. Um, and it's like managing any fear or any unwanted emotion. We have to cultivate shame resilience. And so that's what I do is to help deal with and promote positive self-regard. And the ways that we avoid feeling shame are what really take over for us. There are um, three main ways that we do this. One is to be perfect, to strive for perfection. Um, perfectionism is one way that we try to avoid being feeling shame because if we are perfect, then we won't feel bad. We will feel that we belong. We've got everything, our ducks in a row. And the thing about that, as you all know, is not only is shame unachieved, un, sorry, is perfection unachievable. It doesn't exist because even if you throw the most amazing party, let's say you throw a cocktail party and um, the food is divine. Everything is timed perfectly. And, um, the menu, the lighting, the ambiance, the guests, the conversation, everything just seemed magical. And all of your guests leave and you close the door behind you and you say, wow, that was just the perfect night. You still can't control perception. You still can't control whether anyone left the event and thought, yeah, that was the worst. The meal was late. It was cold. Um, I couldn't get anyone interested in what I was saying. Um, I couldn't believe that she served olives. I hate olives. Um, there was none of my favorite drink. Um, I didn't care for the dessert. You know, we, in other words, no matter how hard we work and how good we feel about what we accomplish, there will always be someone to criticize it and someone who doesn't feel that it was their definition of perfection because perfection doesn't exist, right? It's a myth. Um, so perfectionism was the way that I tried to go through life to avoid feeling shame. Others forebode joy. And this is this idea that if I don't let myself feel too happy, then I won't be disappointed. Um, if I don't let myself 
feel um, too good or that life's going too well, then I won't feel bad when things are bad. I will just stay neutral. Um, but you know, if you don't, you can't selectively choose your emotional realm. You can only feel what's real. And when you try to avoid feeling certain things, you can't selectively choose which emotions you're going to feel and which you're not going to feel. And when you try to do that, if you try to minimize disappointment, you're also going to minimize joy. If you try to minimize anger or frustration or rage, you're also going to minimize satisfaction and passion and real living, real valuable emotion. And so um, the last thing that people do to avoid feeling shame and feeling bad about themselves is numbing. And we know that we do this all the time. We numb with shopping. We numb with food. We numb with binge watching. And basically all the things we do that to numb are not bad things. In fact, they're all the things that we enjoy and that make us feel good. It's just our intention. Why are we doing them? Are we doing them intentionally to avoid something? That's different than just intentionally to live and make choices for our own self-care. So it's a fine line between numbing and self-care. And when we numb, it means we're avoiding feeling something. And what's been so interesting is during these pandemic times, we have not been able to escape from our own pain and our own struggle because we've had limitations put on us on the things that we can do to divert our attention from the here and now. Uh, it's harder to go shopping unless you're doing it online, right? It's harder to, um, people can do all sorts of self-destructive things for sure um, that are numbing, like overeating, over drinking, over consumption, um, over watching, over distracting, um, ignoring. And, and so the point is that we do all these things to avoid feeling bad about ourselves in that moment, to avoid feeling shame and pain and a sense that we're not worthy and that we don't belong. And so all of this is to say that we're always combating that sense of feeling not enough or feeling too much. Um, and we're walking that fine line. And so again, I just want to revisit this idea that we're not going to avoid feeling shame, but what we're going to do together is cultivate shame resilience. And that's the ability to bounce back from these small, seemingly insignificant things that can keep us feeling forever like we're not enough, no matter how much we do. Um, and no matter where your programming or conditioning began, um, you are still programmable. You know, we used to think that the, the brain stopped developing at age like 25 and that adulthood ended at 25. And now we know that's not true at all. Um, that thanks to neuroscience and data collection, we know that the brain remains plastic or able to learn new things. Old dogs can learn new tricks for a very long time um, and really all of our lifetime. You know, I've heard stories of people who didn't start learning um, Greek philosophy until they were in their 90s. And now this woman is the, the master of that. And so we're, we're never done growing. And, um, you know, here's the thing is confidence doesn't come from achieving greatness. It doesn't just come from achieving greatness. It, it comes from high shame resilience. And so when you have high shame resilience, you have high self-regard because you can admire yourself and have a relationship with yourself that is positive and affirming. And so that's where I'm just ending you ending today with my little daily inspiration and would love to talk with you more about this if you find it to be helpful. Have a great day.